Ah, greetings and welcome, welcome to this, our first in the settings uh, category of videos that we're going to be making for you. I am, of course, dressed like, well, I don't know what I'm dressed like, but I thought I'd get into costume because we're talking settings, right? So, to kick off the very first setting, I thought, let's hit that big elephant in the room. Let's look at the setting of Dungeons and Dragons. Now, I know there's a lot of you out there who are going to be saying, oh, well, there's Eberron, there's uh, all the ones that I can't now suddenly remember, which is not a problem because, well, we're talking about our own settings. We're not going to be breaking down the settings that have been pre-created for you by some very talented writers. We're talking about our own setting. So when we look at the Dungeons and Dragons setting, we've got a couple areas that we need to critically look at before we decide exactly how to proceed. It's not as dungeony or as dragony as you might think. Oh, I know, I know, I know. It was bad. No judging. All right, I'm, I'm dressed like a merchant. All right. Just... So what are our expectations when we look at the Dungeons and Dragons setting? And, of course, Dungeons & Dragons has been around for a remarkably long time and has generated a lot of media, both positive and negative, in its, what, 30 or 40 year history. It was certainly the very first role-playing game that I ever played, and that was many, many, many years ago. It was the Red Box, which, if you don't know what that is, you are not old enough. So when we look at our expectations of Dungeons and Dragons, the very first thing that comes to mind are the very iconic races, which have been brought from all other types of fantasy, admittedly, but have been really given a lot of flesh and a lot of life in the Dungeons and Dragons settings. So we have elves, and we've got different classes of elves, and different Dungeons and Dragons pre-generated settings have given them different names, but ostensibly you've got normal elves, or the High Elves, as they like to call them, or the Grey Elves, or whatever name you want to give them. You've got the Forest-dwelling Elves, you've got the Dark Drow, and then you have perhaps some kind of intermediary or a celestial type of elf, if you really like. So we've got Elves, we've got Dwarves, and traditionally the Dwarves don't like the Elves. We've got Orcs, which are always marauding masses and are very typical kind of Orcs. Uh, we've got... Uh, the newer kind of races that they added, the Asimir and the Tiefling and that kind of thing. But primarily, when you think Dungeons and Dragons, you're thinking these very high uh, types of races. These elves and dwarves and uh, gnomes and halflings and that kind of thing. You're also thinking dragons. Now, Dungeons and Dragons pits dragons against the players all over the place, and there is most, in all likelihood, the dragon component of the monster's compendium is the most elaborate and the most detailed, with dragons coming in different colors, metallic dragons, crystal dragons came in and went out again of favor. So the dragon component is there. And what does this lead to in terms of expectation? What does it really do for us? Well, we need to look at the next part of the expectation, which is something that Dungeons & Dragons has always delivered highly on, and that a lot of its classes, that's the type of character that you can play within the game, rely very heavily on magic and divine power. And of course, in Dungeons & Dragons, the two are considered separate, they have different mechanics for how they work. One comes from the gods, the divine power, the other is some kind of arcane power which gets drawn upon. Of course, there's another type which comes in and out of favor again as each system is rewritten, which is the psychic power, which is another kind of entity on its own, though it's far less favored than the magic and the divine, because it's a little bit more tricky to control and they haven't had much success with psychic characters in the various uh, iterations of the game that have come out. We are, of course, now on D&D 5th edition, which is not called 5th edition, it's just called Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, it is the best of the five, in my opinion. I started on Advanced Dungeons & Dragons many, many, many years ago. But we're not talking system, we're talking setting. Another thing that, of course, one expects in Dungeons & Dragons is for there to be castles and dungeons. We expect to have encounters in dungeons. After all, that's what's in the name. Uh, yes, I am talking in broad strokes here, but remember, the first part of identifying what will make your setting work is identifying what other people think or know they 
or think they know about that particular world. So when you say Dungeons and Dragons, you should be jotting down the things like I have jotted down that come to mind when you say Dungeons and Dragons. And of course, the next thing is quests. That's what the whole thing is about. You go on these great quests to solve problems by slaying dragons inside dungeons. You earn experience points, which allows you to go up levels so you can slay bigger dragons in bigger dungeons and so on and so forth in perpetuity. So that's what we expect. We expect high fantasy. We expect elves, we expect dwarves, we expect orcs. And to a large degree, we expect the races to behave in certain ways. Elves are long-lived, dwarves live a little bit sh longer than humans, gnomes blow themselves up because they're tinkerers, uh, orcs live fairly short lives, goblins live even shorter lives, halflings are very short but have long lives. So there's a certain amount of expectation that surrounds this idea of Dungeons and Dragons. Now, once we've built up the expectation, what do we expect? What do our players expect from the setting? We then need to look at what kind of stories come out of that setting. When you say Dungeons and Dragons, does your mind fill with plots of, oh, well, we can do X, Y, and Z. And broadly speaking, there are a couple plots that stand out over, say, other systems. And the first one is the plot that revolves around magic or the divine. So because magic and divinity is so integral into the way that Dungeons and Dragons works as a setting, it makes sense that a lot of the plots could be centered around finding that magical tome, defeating the necromancer who's raising a gigantic army using lots of magic, defeating the high uh, archbishop who is raising armies of evil zealots to go forth and slay in the name of his particular god. It's about defeating gods. If you're fighting dragons, well, they're pretty close to divinity anyway. So the one major plot thread, plot line, if you like, should be looking at magic and divinity. And if it doesn't really appeal to you as a GM, or if your players are like, nah, 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 magic's a bit tricky because if you can't cast it, it's difficult to counter it. And so you're kind of getting stuck if you're in a very high magic world that you need to be able to use magic. If you are facing gods, well, you need to have a high divinity or a high religion score, and that kind of puts you on a railroad type of adventure. So if you are thinking any of that, then I don't think Dungeons & Dragons is a great setting for you, since it is so integral. Another thing that comes to mind when you're talking Dungeons & Dragons in terms of possible plots is exploring castles, dungeons, and ruins. That means lots of traps, lots of riddles, lots of problem solving about getting across one chasm floor whole thing to the next room or whatever the case might be. Again, if this is something that excites you and you go, oh, I could build a dungeon inside the belly of a giant worm that's tunneling its way through the Earth's core and the players have got to solve that by using their wits and their sword and magic and divine power and that kind of thing, then go for it. There's nothing wrong with that. So you can use the plots to try and look at whether your setting is going to hold up to what you want to do. And that holds up. We know we're expecting magic, we're expecting divinity, we're expecting gigantic monsters that have amazing powers. So a worm bothering to the center of the earth with the players stuck inside it, exploring the labyrinth that is their intestinal tract, certainly fits the bill for Dungeons and Dragons. So this is where it's not critical in terms of what comes first, expectations or plots, plots or then expectations, or is it that plots come out of the expectations? I'm not entirely sure of the relationship there, but it allows you to cross-reference and really make sure that the setting that you're after, this Dungeons and Dragons high fantasy setting, is something that you really want to explore. Another thing that could possibly come out of the various expectations from Dungeons and Dragons is a racial or political game where your characters are being pawns in the grand plot of the bishop of the evil forces of darkness and the good king and his valiant queen are desperate for their aid to solve problems. So it could be a political game. Is it designed specifically to be a political game? Not necessarily, because if we go back to those expectations, we see that there is a lot of battle. There's a lot of, we have bad creatures, we have good heroes. I don't really recall too much of 
a sense of deep politics being played out although having said that the first Dungeons and Dragons movie which is really the only one you should watch if you really want to watch b-grade material in the first place did seem to hinge around the politics thing Dungeons and Dragons is not Game of Thrones and Game of Thrones is not high fantasy yes it has dragons yes there are some dungeons or old ruins or castles that they move through but when you say divine power sure there's certain things happening in there that reek of divine power but it's very 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 low key lord of the rings also doesn't fit into the dungeons and dragons high fantasy genre we have wizards who are thousands of years old and transcend and etc etc and we have elves and we have orcs and we have all manner of goblins and giant spiders and things but it isn't high fantasy you don't have clerics running around healing everybody you have an elf who runs around and grabs a herb and she uses medicine to heal various wounds which may be magically infected but it's again not high fantasy not everyone's running around with magical items riding on magical beasts and the more i talk about it the more i realize that lord of the rings could be high fantasy if you really really stretch the definition but in my mind it has never sat in the high fantasy category that dungeons and dragons does dungeons and dragons really pushes the limit of magic and divine influence in the world that the character's in so now we've looked at the potential plots that could exist within a dungeons and dragons setting we then need to look at the tone now we haven't really explored tone in these video series and i might very well need to do so in the near future but tone is about what is the manner in which your game is going to play out is it going to be comedy is it going to be fast is it going to be high high fantasy is it going to be dark fantasy what is the tone that you're striving for if you want to do dark fantasy or hard reality fantasy again dungeons and dragons is not the solution Dungeons and Dragons has again lots of magic and lots of divine power which is easy to come across grimy gritty reality type fantasy the likes that you might find in the Lord of the Rings for example just doesn't fit with Dungeons and Dragons where every first level priest can cast healing so you've really got to look at that setting in terms of your tone what type of tone is this a hard survival game do you want your players to slog through swamps and wish for death if that was the case dungeons and dragons is not the right setting for you if however you want your players to move through the evil swamps defeating scourges and manticores left right and center to find that lost ruin in the middle of the swamp to bash open that secret door that is in his wall side to work out the first trap to disarm the giant boulder that would have squashed them to slay 50 kobolds that live inside that first chamber and then to continue deeper in destroying slaying and being heroes then dungeons and dragons is the right setting for you now i know that i don't want to talk particularly about the systems that you should use but if you look at dungeons and dragons it's more than just a system it is really an entire space in which one might operate so that's why i've chosen to look at it as our first setting once you've kind of looked at the tone that you're trying to set and we really with dungeons and dragons high fantasy is your only option here uh, you've got paladins you've got clerics you've got rangers you've got witches you've got oracles you've got all manner of arch mages hedge mages etc 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 there's lots of fantasy there's lots of magic going on here with high fantasy to set the tone to make your setting work you now need to step back and say okay this is what we're expecting we're expecting elves we're expecting dwarves we're expecting dragons we're expecting dungeons we've got priests running around everywhere that have got divine power from a known entity by the way that's one of the things that separates dungeons and dragons a lot from say reality is that it's very difficult to be an atheist in a world where the gods purposefully give clerics powers which they can manifest they can actually raise the dead they can actually walk on water so this is a world where if you don't believe in gods you've got to be blind deaf dumb mute and nowhere near a priest who could remove those afflictions from you so what do we now look at when we when we bring all of this together now we look at putting on your own personal stamp to it 
So if you're looking at, say, the setting of Ravenloft, ah, there we go, I remembered one, which was a Dungeons and Dragons setting where there was lots of vampires and necromancy and the undead. It was really like traveling to the heart of Transylvania in 1880. And there you were in this fantasy setting with, with like I said, vampires and things. The, the making it your own, the stamp that you need to put onto it. And this for me is what separates a good GM from a great GM. A good GM is someone who can pick up one of those settings and really interpret it well so that the players feel like they are in Castle Ravenloft or they feel like they're in whatever other cities there might be out there that exist in the Dungeons and Dragons settings. To be a truly great GM, you need to make your own settings. Take your own place amongst the creators of universes. That is, after all, one of the reasons why we're here, isn't it? We want to tell great stories in our own environment. So you look at what people are expecting and you say, how can you twist it? How can you change it? How can you make it something that will work and have its own flavor? Now, you don't have to rewrite everything. You don't have to make the elves a completely different race. You don't have to do that. You just need to tweak it. Tweak enough things and suddenly it becomes your own. So in the world of Braxia that I run, I have high elves because that's what my players are expecting. They understand how to deal with high elves. They're arrogant and they're haughty and they're long-lived, so they don't need to move at a particularly fast pace, politically or emotionally at all. However, I decided that my high elves, because they're very arrogant and haughty and think they know everything, are divided into two classes. The noble-born and then the commoners. And the commoners cannot hold position within the noble-born, and the noble-born have decided that it is better that each serves a term of office and then moves on. So there is no long-lived emperor or administrator who has been in the post for 400 years. The boredom factor would set in. So you are an administrator for 10 years, and then perhaps you are a general for 10 years, and then you are this for 10 years, and you are that for 10 years. If you have 800 years to live, that gives you an opportunity to kind of cycle through every occupation there is. That's how I would keep myself entertained, if I lived that long. So that's one type of elf. Then I decided I was going to have the drow because I quite like the idea of these dark-skinned subterranean elves. But I wanted them to be different from what the drow prescribed in most of the uh, Dungeons and Dragons settings were. So I turned them into Romans. They have a senate, they have a praetor who rules over the senate and has been voted into power by the senate. The senate is run by senators who all are noble houses and they have their own intrigues and politics as well. Then I decided that I wanted to have desert elves because elves traditionally have always been perceived as being in the forests or in lofty sort of towers locked away in very high mountains studying magic. So I created the Sajet Elf, which is effectively a very, 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 very poor copy of the Egyptian way of life. The Egyptians to me always seemed slightly elvish with their funny, very black ochred eyes and their approach to life, building gigantic temples that took decades to construct. That's a very elvish approach in my opinion. So I just slapped the Egyptian mythos over those elves and created the Sajet Elf. So that's just one way of interpreting the expectations of my players. Now they come across a Sajet Elf and they go, oh, are they the same as High Elves? Are they the same as Wood Elves? Are they the... Oh, they're not. Oh, oh, well, that's kind of cool. Okay, they're slightly different. Then the Wood Elves, which are traditionally a little bit more down to earth and homely uh, and more in keeping with Grimm's fairy tale type of elves, I turned into cannibals because that's much more interesting than a bunch of tree huggers. Imagine if hippies ran around eating the people trying to unchain them from trees. That would change things up a little bit, wouldn't it? Perhaps our great GM needs to decide to do that. Please don't. That would be a terrifying, terrifying aspect. Someone running at you dressed in rainbow colors with sharpened teeth. I Anyway, the point of the matter is you don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's just about how you decorate the wheel and maybe add some more wheels into the cog. That is how you help create setting. And with fantasy, you've got long-lived people. That means their approach to things are going to be different. So, like the dwarves, for example. 
I've decided to give them really, really long names. And to give them this whole culture based around the fact that if you're going to be living for 300 years, and according to Dungeons & Dragons expectations, are going to be living in mines, you've got plenty of time. So what's wrong with giving your character a very long name? It gives them a much more personable approach than just calling him Angus. But if his name is Stor Brakala Dash Dohor Mahach De, well, try and say that five times. It suddenly creates a little bit of a culture within the dwarves that players have not encountered before. By changing things up just a little bit, and I know I keep repeating this, but that's the theme of how to make the setting your own. Are all dragons good, neutral and evil? Well, change it up. Give them something else. In my campaign, I banish them to a different dimension and they're trying to get back in again. I have a high fantasy setting. I can do that. And now I've got a whole bunch of people using all that magic and divine to try and bring them across and to try and prevent them from being brought across. The point of the matter is, in a high fantasy setting, you need to make sure that the tone that you've decided upon is reinforced time and time and time again. No village should be without its priest, its wizard, its witch, its little infestation of goblins, or its problem with orcs, or flying ships, or unicorns, or pegasi, or a dragon problem. They should always be in your descriptors, that element of magic. The mayor's gold chain that he wears moves and changes shape as he changes mood. When he makes a decision, his cloak changes color. For example, in my campaign, a dagger that the character has, it's not just a plus one dagger, it's a fish that acts like a dagger and can do all sorts of weird and wonderful things, like slapping the characters in the face with a wet fish. Try to think outside of the box. Use that little imagination technique that we spoke about in, I think, episode one to just alter. Now, another good thing to do when you're looking at a setting like high fantasy is to immerse yourself in high fantasy. So if you look at something like Game of Thrones, it's not really high fantasy. It might be mid fantasy. It's mainly around the politics and the characters and the survival issues that the characters are going through. So a couple of films, and I wrote them down so that I don't forget them, that you can look at that really embraces the high fantasy idea. There was a wonderful film made called Willow, and it was made in the 90s by George Lucas. He wrote the story. He didn't direct it. Steven Spielberg directed it, as a matter of fact. And Willow is this wonderful story of these halflings called... Uh, oh, well, there it goes. You know what was going to happen. These halflings trying to save Alora Dannon, this little Daikini baby. Daikini was the name that these little halfling people gave to the humans. And they had Mad Mordigan, who's this warrior who's a drunkard, but he can kill anything that he comes across, and Bav Morda, the evil witch sorceress who could turn people into pigs and all sorts of weird and wonderful things, and giant monsters and trolls and magic. It's just a wonderful film to watch. Any of the D&D movies embrace the idea of high fantasy. Most of the 1980s movies that involved fantasy have a strong element of Dungeons and Dragons because that's really where a lot of them drew their inspiration from and vice versa. Then there was a wonderful obscure film called The Seventh Son with Jeff Bridges as this wizened old warrior sorcerer thing and they were using magic and fighting demons and undead and all sorts of weird and wonderful things it's an absolute treat for the senses it really is a good old-fashioned movie another one to look at is stardust what a beautiful film and what an amazing film as well lots of high fantasy in there we've got sailing pirate ships that fly through the air and we've got stars that fall to the ground and are actually people and witches who do all sorts of wonderful things it's absolutely magical. And then if you're really, really, really desperate to see some more high fantasy, although very poorly executed, is the film Aragon. It was supposed to have six or seven sequels, but it tanked at the box office because it was very, very, very dull. However, it involved dragons, it involved magic and sorcerers and that kind of thing, but just some very bad, very weird casting going on in there. 
This has been a very long exploration of the Dungeons & Dragons setting, and I hope it has given you some insight into how to use the setting, to use the plots that suggest themselves, to use the tone that you want to try and set, to help determine your setting and to help shape your setting so that it's more of your own and less of what's come out of something that's been pre-generated that your players have encountered before. Now, as I like to finish off, usually I'm going to say, watch after this video. We've got something special for you made by a couple of our friends. Uh, it's unfortunately a once-off because it was a labor of love, but I think you might be pleasantly surprised by it. It's rather entertaining. Until then, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, share us with all of your friends, and until next time, happy gaming.